start recording. So um, it's for Yuri's Night 2011 Golden Anniversary of Human Space Flight uh, video interview. So we'll start this off. Could you please introduce yourself and your affiliation? Well, I'm Michael Simpson. I'm president of the International Space University. How has the first 50 years of human space flight changed society? Well, I think one of the things that's most impressive about the first 50 years is that during that period of time, human beings have sent just a little over 500 representatives of our species into space. They've proven their ability to work with machines and robots to perform construction tasks, to solve problems on Earth and discover a few things beyond. Um, the reality is in those 50 years, human beings have fulfilled a ambition that's existed in the human spirit for thousands of years before. Uh, so we've lived in a period of time where what people used to dream about came true. And now uh, new dreams are beginning. What do you envision for the next 50 years of human spaceflight to be like? Well, I think that the transition that will mark the next 50 years is that we will go from placing representatives of our species in orbit to placing human society in orbit. And this doesn't necessarily mean colonization or huge settlements off Earth. What it means is that more and more groups of humans will be functioning beyond Earth's atmosphere uh, to uh, mine resources, to explore uh, uh, the moon, I think in those 50 years, probably Mars, uh, to discover not only answers to old questions, but whole new interesting questions. But they'll be doing it together. And by doing it together, they will need more and more social organization, more and more study of how they interrelate with each other in long periods away from their home planet. Uh, this is going to be the challenge for the next 50 years, not just the technology of moving people and their machines to great distances, but finding out how human beings will interrelate with each other in an environment where they are definitely dependent on each other uh, and in a uh, set of circumstances totally different from the ones in which we evolved as a species. How did you first get your start in the space industry? Well, I like to tell people that to some extent it was as a, uh, uh, as a young dreamer. Uh, I looked, uh, looked up at the sky at the early uh, satellite traces as they moved across the sky and began to think that uh, this was a very interesting time to live in. Uh, early on in my career as a young uh, Naval Reserve officer, I was a net consumer of space information, combining it with other sources of information to draw conclusions that were appropriate to the Cold War era that I served in. Um, I think what emerged out of that was a sense of just how incredibly involved space technology and the knowledge it could generate could be in so many phases of my life. Then of course it it really took form when uh, in 2004 I was asked to lead the International Space University. Uh, since then all those early conclusions have been confirmed and a whole new set of dreams have emerged. Um, and, of course, could you please say a few words for the people around the world that will be celebrating Yuri's Night 2011, the golden anniversary of human spaceflight? Well, I remember um, looking at the news that Yuri Gagarin had actually orbited the Earth, uh, recognizing that a person made of the same kind of flesh and blood that I'm made of had, had survived an experience no other human being had ever survived. Uh, I looked at it a little differently than some because my grandfather was a um, Russian speaker and uh, uh, took a particular kind of pride in the fact that uh, uh, here was somebody who uh, read the same language, thought the same language, who had actually spent uh, uh, an entire orbit of the Earth uh, in, a, in a spacecraft. Um, for the people who are looking forward to the next forms of excitement. Uh, I tell them that there are extraordinary new accomplishments ahead of us. 
um, that uh, we don't necessarily need to duplicate what's been done in the past. We need to to simply dream as deeply and as thoroughly as people did 50 years ago and with as much rigor as they did 50 years ago. Because 50 years ago, they knew not only the dream, but how hard it was going to be to accomplish the dream. Uh, Yuri Gagarin went to space not being positive that he would be able to return alive. Uh, most of the people who followed him in the early days had the same understanding, that there was no guarantee. Now, there's a bit more of a guarantee, but we know it's not a perfect guarantee. And so we need the dream, we need to work hard, we need to plan, and we need the dare. And I think uh, if we do that, then the next 50 years we'll see human beings on the surface of Mars, but more importantly, it'll see the fruits of human effort and intellect um, spread across a whole new range of applications that maybe we haven't even begun to dream of yet. These are the, uh, the secondary questions. Uh, what is the source of your passion for space exploration? Well, you know, I think it's, it, it's the sense from uh, early, day, uh, early days as, as a child looking up at space and realizing that somehow it was attainable, that it wasn't just a, a deep black expanse with uh, spots of light in it. It, it, was, a, it was a place that our, our machines could go to uh, and very soon after our, our species could go to. Uh, and, and a feeling that this was an area about which we know so little and there's something about the human mind that doesn't like not knowing more about what it knows little about. And so I think we're drawn to space by curiosity, we're drawn to space by a growing body of evidence that it keeps showing us opportunities to accomplish things that we had uh, not previously suspected. And we're drawn to space by something almost primordial in the human spirit that uh, uh, we like to venture, we like to climb to the tops of hills and see what's beyond. What uh, space figure do you most admire? Well, you know, in many ways, uh, and this is going to sound sort of funny, um, I think I most admire um, Michael Collins. Uh, the guy that had to sit up in the command module while Neil and Buzz went to the surface, who had to think for three days about what it might be like if they couldn't get back and he had to bring that command module home on his own, uh, who had to think that two men were having a dream accomplished that he might well not be able to accomplish. And he did his work wonderfully well. Uh, the rendezvous was a success. The, the command module was uh, well tended while it waited for its two missing passengers to return. Um, the, um, uh, I think the, the allegory there is that all of us at one point or another need to sacrifice part of our dream so that the entire species uh, can fulfill the dream of humankind. Um, Michael Collins didn't get to the surface of the moon, uh, but without him, nobody uh, on Apollo 11 got to the surface of the moon. Um, how do you think we can best educate the public about space and get them involved? Well, you know, I think the public responds to enthusiasm. They don't respond to arguments. Um, uh, we argue a lot in the space sector. We, we love to, to fight with each other over whether we should go to asteroids or the moon or Mars or bypass the whole thing, go straight to Titan, uh, set up a, an oil refinery on the surface of Titan. Now, it, I, I think what we need to do is to simply share more often just how enthusiastic we are. Um, uh, the fact that there is something that is both intellectually and emotionally uh, attractive about moving beyond what we know and getting a new perspective on things. Uh, people need to also hear from us uh, some of the practical examples that inspire us. Um, you know, the Russians and then later the Americans went to, uh, went to Venus. We found the planet far hotter than we thought it should be. And that opened our eyes to the fact that our own planet was getting warmer. Um, it took several steps 
it took people who were willing to take that data and analyze it and look for uh, evidence on Earth. But the reality is greenhouse effect we essentially discovered on Venus. We didn't go looking for it. We discovered it because we were looking for new perspectives and were willing to open ourselves to new ideas. Uh, that happens regularly. Serendipity plays a role in human learning. Um, I think we need to share that with people and to say that we're not only confident that can happen again and again, but we have hints that it has already happened in a lot of very important areas. And uh, one final uh, question here. What piece of advice would you give to someone who wants to get involved in the space industry? Well, I think the first thing is that the uh, space industry itself and uh, many of the agencies that handle the uh, government operation of space policy are getting better and better at communicating their story. I, I certainly suggest that they learn something of that story, that they spend a little bit of time on the hard work that the folks have done with their websites and their publications to, to just look at what people have made happen. And then to start dreaming about what they would like to see happen that hasn't happened. And then to start thinking hard about what they're already doing that might be useful in the space sector. Because all those things tie together. Faith in what's happened before. Dreams about things that people haven't even dared believe could happen yet. And then an understanding that some of what you're already doing is something that can be useful in the space sector. Uh, more and more companies are discovering that skills that they have can be spun into space and that they don't have to only think about taking um, technologies and scientific ideas that have been developed in space and applying them on Earth. There are things where individual companies solving problems in automotive uh, fields, in aeronautics, in shipbuilding, in electronics, in information technology, in a whole host of fields are already doing that the space sector could probably use, where there's a problem waiting just that solution. Uh, the key is to go looking for that and to recognize that space is not an economic one-way street that there are th problems being solved in very down-to-earth circumstances every day that can in fact be useful uh, as we look out towards uh, the future needs of the space sector. So get involved by knowing what's happening, by dreaming about what could happen, but also by recognizing you may already be doing something that could be useful to the space sector. Okay, well thank you for your time. <laughs> Good. Piece of cake. <laughs>